Jordan Love is now the highest paid player in NFL history. Yeah. Jordan Love. Oh. So Jordan Love's the guy right now. Uh, Four-year, $220 million extension, $155 million guaranteed, and $75 million signing bonus. How about Jordan Love and his contract here, Sam? What a 12 months for Jordan Love, right? We get to sign this kind of weird uh, halfway house deal where it's like they're not 100% convinced that Jordan Love is the guy. Let's give him this kind of contract instead of picking up the fifth-year option type of thing. And now he's the highest-paid quarterback ever. Um, and really, so two of the question mark or the, the scary thing, the red flag, if you like, was is he a system quarterback? Does you know Can he play in the cold weather in Kansas City? All these kinds of things. Jordan Love, the question mark is just sample size. Like, if you buy into what we saw in the second half of the season last year, it's fine. Done. He looked phenomenal. Like, he was legitimately arguably the best quarterback in football, capable of making every throw you want, spectacular plays, you know, Patrick Mahomes, Aaron Rodgers-esque savant-type stuff from the pocket, incredible ball location, everything you want to see. If you buy into the idea that that was real, there's nothing to say about the contract whatsoever other than completely justified, 100%, well done, sir. Uh, But we've been doing this long enough that we've seen things like that happen before, and it it might not be real. It, it could be, and I, I'm, conv- I'm convinced. Like I watched him; he looked phenomenal. But it wouldn't be the first time a quarterback has hit like eight games of that kind of level and then not backed it up. At, so I think the comps for this are there, there's not many. There's really not many. So the ones that you and I bring up all the time. Last year at this time, we were talking about Trevor Lawrence through this light. In year two, though, this was year two of Trevor Lawrence's career as a starter. That was 2022, right around week eight or nine. Switch flipped, looked different. He was, and when we do this, and it's, you know, some people think it's disingenuous when you use data like this. Other times, I do think it tells a story, or it's at least trying to tell a story. When you cut the season in half or whatever, especially for young quarterbacks, you say, well, since week eight, since week nine, and this is what we did with Trevor Lawrence, he was QB two at the end of 2022 and for Lawrence it kind of made sense because the eye test said man he's definitely playing better took him a year and a half to kind of work out some of the kinks but now he's starting to play at the level of maybe not the generational prospect but high-end prospect right now love is similar because it was a mid-season flip but it was also after three and a half years of development or three years of development on the bench And after a first season where it was his first year as a starter. So there's really not a whole lot of comps. We did again, we did this with Baker Mayfield in his third season, right? 2020. After the midway point, it was like, man, 90 plus great. He looks great. That's the best. So there's some comps, but there's not a Jordan Love did it first year as starter where it was really the tale of two seasons as in his first year. No, I mean, it's it's definitely unusual. The Baker Mayfield one, I think, is definitely the best comp for what we saw last year in terms of it doesn't always stay, right? Like Baker Mayfield in 2020, so what, third year in the league, um, he'd had, came in as a rookie, set rookie records as a, touch, a touchdown record. Year two unraveled, that was... Uh, bad, and then year three he bounces back, and at the halfway point of the year it was like a flip, a, a switch had flipped, and Baker had arrived. And to put some numbers on that arrival from week seven onwards, and I only chose that because that was the the ninety plus get, the grade that really broke him out. Um, from week seven onwards in twenty twenty. Baker Mayfield was QB2 by PFF grading, behind only Aaron Rodgers, whose numbers were, like, absolutely insane. Um, Baker threw 20 touchdowns to three interceptions, had a PFF grade of 91.7, adjusted completion rate of 78%, you know, passer rating of 100. Like, everything you want is there for Baker. And you're like, all right, perfect. That's it. We saw incredible flashes as a rookie. Year two was bad, but it wasn't his fault. And then year three, the switch flipped at halfway, and now Baker Mayfield has arrived. That's why he was the number one overall pick, and blah, 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 right? Done. If he, like, that's exactly where we are with Jordan Love now, only instead of, you know, impressive rookie season, year two, that, like, instead of the, the meandering midpoint of the story, is different. But it's exactly the same dynamic that a couple of years into his career, we finally, the, the switch went on, and now we've convinced ourselves. 
this is who this guy's going to be going forward. Like, if Mayfield's contract was due up at that point, I imagine they would have given him the giant deal that they never gave him. Uh, but it, it didn't. He didn't stay that way, and his career completely unspooled after that, and he gets traded away. So, again, not saying this is going to happen to Jordan Love, but I'm saying that's the thing to be scared of, is that even though we... We were incredibly impressed by what we saw. It was an insanely high level, and I, I'm, I've bought in. Um, it, I, I also bought in with Baker Mayfield in 2020, and like it didn't, it didn't happen that way. Uh, I'm going to tell you why I've bought in though on the Jordan Love thing. Not trying to be a downer for Packers fans here. We're just trying to say like this last year was was rare, but not unprecedented as far as the the turnaround for Love. I mean, there would also be Packers fans who said, well, you guys were just wrong about the first half of the season. He was fine. He was just trying to figure things out, whatever it might be. But I'm buying into Jordan Love because I believe that second half stretch, um, right up until the playoff game against the Niners, it wasn't just things were better. I mean, it looked special. There were special throws in there. There was the aesthetics of it looked like Aaron Rodgers for whatever it ma- for whatever that matters. It doesn't really matter, but there was... Those confidence play confidence was through the roof. He was throwing the ball into tight windows at an incredible rate. And he was doing it with a bunch of young receivers. And that's why I think I'm buying into this as well. We spend a lot of time talking on these shows, Sam, about Tua and Brock Purdy and all their weapons and how the weapons elevate the quarterback, which is absolutely true. But I think we need to apply this in the Jordan Love situation. I think he has good receivers in Green Bay. But if you told me at the beginning of last season, all right, we don't know, you know, Christian Watson's going to be hurt. We're going to have a second round rookie in Jaden Reed. We're going to have year two of Romeo Dobbs. We're going to have two rookie tight ends, you know, uh, another rookie in Dontavian Wicks. Jordan Love was growing with this group. And again, I think they're good, but there's no superstar amongst those receivers in Green Bay. And Jordan Love was putting up the numbers that he did and throwing the ball the way he did and making good decisions. There was so much to love about Jordan Love's second half. So the difference between, I think, his contract and Tua's, I think the Dolphins need to figure out, okay, how much can we take away? How much? How are we going to build this team around Tua right now with this contract limitation? Well, in Green Bay, they don't spend a ton in free agency. They have a a draft and develop type of system where they just sprinkle in a few free agents over the top. Jordan Love's going to develop with these young receivers. Green Bay is going to continue to to do a good job drafting and developing players around him. And the contract won't limit their ability to build their team, I guess. So I think both of those things are really important. Green Bay has this really good infrastructure, plus I'm buying into Love's second half breakout, how special he looked. And I think he's going to, again, not, not continue to just get better and be the best quarterback in the league necessarily, but he's in this high end status and capable of, putting a team on his back the way he did at points last year. Yeah, and even kind of connected to that, but but very different is unlike Tua, unlike Dak Prescott, who we'll get to in a minute, um, the Packers don't need the money to go elsewhere. Like with Tua, our concern is, is too much of that money relative to the credit pie now lying in Tua's bank account relative to Tyreek Hill, to Jalen Waddle, to all the other players they've got to pay keep happy, keep in the building. Um, The Cowboys are going to be dealing with the same thing with Dak Prescott relative to CeeDee Lamb, relative to Micah Parsons, et cetera, et cetera. With Green Bay, like all of their young playmakers are on rookie deals and not even like far in the rookie deals necessarily. They're, They're incredibly cheap. It's the youngest offense in the NFL. It's going to be the cheapest offense in the NFL. So Jordan Love can take all the money for a while and it not have any problems whatsoever. Like, they have a lot of runway to figure out where the rest of the money is going to get distributed around this roster because it's so young and so cheap. So, yeah, it's it's interesting that he did the heavy lifting with this group that doesn't look like it necessarily elevates the play of the quarterback, but also it's so cheap now that if they continue to get better and if they become a group that helps him, you know, hit his ceiling as a quarterback – it's fine because all of, like he can take this the giant he can take top of the market money quarterback deal and it not have this detrimental effect on a roster that you might be concerned about for the other two. The other piece that I want to address here as well, um, I've same thing with the Michael Penix thing. Green Bay back in 2020 drafted Jordan Love to draft and develop him. 
we had not had much evidence of this strategy even being attempted in recent years. It felt like more of an old school 70s, 80s, 90s strategy. You draft a quarterback, he sits, and at some point he develops on the bench and, and you go. This worked. It worked for Green Bay. I think it worked. I mean, again, we, we need Jordan Love to confirm it and continue to be really good. But kudos to the Packers. And um, there is a nuanced answer here, too, Sam. We've said if they had drafted T. Higgins, I always use Ayuk, but I was wrong on it. Ayuk was off the board. If they have drafted T. Higgins instead of Jordan Love, would that put them over the hump in a couple NFC championship games or in the NFC playoffs? Maybe. Right. Maybe they could have snuck another Super Bowl with Aaron Rodgers. It's not as simple as, well, Green Bay was – you had an egg on your face if you questioned – uh, Green Bay back in the day because they were close, right? They were a number one seed two years in a row and failed in the playoffs. Maybe T. Higgins puts them over the top. But the draft and develop strategy absolutely worked as far as Jordan Love goes. And the payoff is the transition from Aaron Rodgers now becomes much smoother here for the Packers. So they deserve credit for that at least. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, the thing about all those uh, what's the right approach conversations is you never get the opposite you never get the a b analysis because like you said you never know what would happen if they drafted a receiver instead for aaron Rodgers. you also don't know what would have happened if you just put jordan love out there year one right like the if we if the pattern is real and if jordan love took like half a season to get himself up to nfl speed and then the second like from that point on he's the guy did we just waste like three years but <laughs> like, and actually a couple of down years of Rogers before we finally said, all right, enough's enough time to move on. Like, did we just waste time of Jordan Love's career and set him back three years instead of just putting him out there, taking eight weeks of lumps, and then Jordan Love would have been Aaron Rodgers anyway? Like, no idea. Like, it, maybe the three years on the sideline was instrumental in that development, or maybe it just wasted three years of his development and his career. You and your counterfactual, Sam. Why can't we just say this worked? I mean, it did work, but but my point being, you have no idea what else could have worked, right? There, there might have been three, all three of those things might have been able to work, right? Drafting a receiver might have got you a Super Bowl. Putting Jordan Love in as, as a rookie or a second-year quarterback might have got you a Super Bowl. And now the current iteration might get you a Super Bowl. Like, all three might be the right way to go, or none of them might be the right way to go. But uh, you started this by saying it's been a crazy 12 months for Love. I mean, it really has been, right? Last year at this time, he was going into his first year as a starter. He had signed a little halfway contract. Like, hey, this will tide you over for a little bit. You get some money, but we're not giving you the big deal. We don't know what you are yet. And halfway through the season, it was like they were playing a whole different game. His QBs and receivers on different pages, inconsistent, inconsistency at the end of games with the game on the line. And then all, all of a sudden, right around Thanksgiving, maybe a little bit before, Jordan Love looks like a star. And um, I I believe the real Jordan Love, by the way, is going to be somewhere in between that. I don't think he'll be as good as Aaron Rodgers, right? That's not going out on a crazy limb, even though that stretch of play, he was in that, I think, in that world. But um, I still think he'll be more than good enough to justify this deal. And to be clear, the dynamic of his previous contract was like the the reading between the lines or the sort of the implicit, uh, the implication of that from Green Bay's uh, point of view is that they weren't bought in 100%. Like if they, if Green Bay believed that Jordan Love was about to do what he actually did, they would have picked up his fifth year option and we would have never signed that weird contract that he signed. The deal that he ended up signing was a sort of, eh, we're not 100% convinced, but let's, let's do this instead, right? That, so it's really easy to forget where they were a year ago because of the season that he just had and say, ah, this, the plan worked. You know, it was always, everyone knew this was the way it was going to be. Perfectly seamless transition plan. Green Bay have cracked the developmental code. But if you rewind to when the, the fifth-year option and the contract stuff got done, that was the reality. Like, Green Bay kind of liked Jordan Love. It was more that they were... There was an out to the Rodgers thing at that point, and okay, it's now or never with Jordan Love. Let's give it a shot. But they were not like 100% bought in. We've nailed it. This guy's a star. Let's go. 